Okay, great. So then uh, let's get started. So I'm, I'm Oscar Ramirez, I'm the CEO and co-founder of the Startup Commons. And together with me today, we have uh, Val Toloikanen on the stage, our senior advisor for ecosystem development and, and related digital solutions. So um, the, the main reason to organize this webinar today is because uh, we usually uh, receive requests or I would say invitations to apply for digital solution developments in the context of uh, innovation entrepreneurship and startup ecosystem development, like for example, ecosystem portal or ecosystem one-stop shop or ecosystem users matching platform, ecosystem mapping tool or ecosystem dashboard. So, and while uh, all these projects uh, were created basically to enable collaboration and ecosystem connectivity and scalability, so truth must be said, uh, those principles or values or requirements are not reflected in the technological requirements that are necessary uh, to develop these solutions. So therefore, the technology uh, which should be considered the enabler for those solutions paradoxically becomes uh, the limiting factor for ecosystem efficiency, scalability and, and growth. Therefore, we had to do something from, from a startup commons point of view. We have to be proactive and again, according to our principles and of open knowledge and sharing, uh, we felt that we had to share this new way uh, to build digital solutions, specifically in the context of ecosystem development and orchestration, and hopefully inspire those who are in that position uh, to design new programs, to design new projects, uh, RFQs and similar uh, goals. So today, while Balto uh, will cover different uh, aspects of this new stack uh, during the webinar, and I really hope that uh, you find it interesting and valuable for, for your ecosystem development uh, works. So Balto, uh, the floor is yours, please. So thank you everyone, also from my side, and uh, happy to take uh, part of the webinar and keep the, the open up the ecosystem OS tech stack a bit more from a couple of different perspectives. So uh, while going through the presentation, uh, I encourage to leave as many questions along the way as possible. And uh, we have colleagues here to basically help take those questions along the way. I will pause every now and then just to check uh, for some of the questions that have uh, come across. And we may take a couple of those um, questions, uh, also voice it over uh, in this webinar. But uh, for, for even if not being able to answer all the questions necessarily on the webinar, depending on the time constraints, uh, we will definitely get back with those uh, questions. We will collect the questions also for later use, and we will get back to those questions um, afterwards as well. And of course, you are always uh, free to reach out uh, via email and through our forms on the website for, for further clarification for any topics, as well as requests for any materials, whether it's presentation or any documents or resources mentioned uh, during the presentation. So I encourage to use that um, option actively um, so that um, so that we can help to also improve uh, content and materials for for future presentations and also help help focus on certain concepts that may be more complex than others and so forth. So this webinar uh, topic and content is specifically tried to create to help bridge um, kind of the gap between the the more technology oriented uh, people, uh, those who you know, work with software, design software, build software, or work with data, data analytics, uh, software architectures, and so forth. And then those who operate uh, the services, 
So uh, let's say the business owners or the, the business development side of the ecosystem, those who interact with customers and typically work through the user interfaces. And, um, and, and as part of this, it's really important um, to try to cover both as, as enough technology aspects and uh, terminology while at the same time keeping that at the level that uh, we can build and continue to build common understanding of, of these, these concepts. So actually, Oscar, you need to enable the screen sharing for me so I can, I can share the presentation. All right, so let's get started. So, so basically, um, during the presentation, we will go through a um, couple of different perspectives. Uh, we start with more familiar topics of uh, startup commons from the kind of ecosystem development uh, from, let's say, the business owner the non-technical people perspective. Uh, then we take a more deeper dive into the uh, ecosystem OS as the tech stack for ecosystem orchestration. And um, then, then we finalize with Q and A's uh, towards the end, but I will also pause in the middle just to check where we are. So, to lay the foundation for, for what we are dealing with um, is that countries, uh, digital economies uh, are, uh, of course, with COVID specifically now hit with the reality that uh, digital economy is getting more and more accelerated and more and more important. So all different countries and cities and state levels are competing to have the world's leading startup ecosystems to sustain the economy. Uh, it can be achieved only when startup ecosystem organizations and roles are networked and there is transparency at uh, different actors in the field. So this is more from starting from a very kind of top level problem uh, perspective. And when we look at the startup ecosystems, they are uh, very messy and, uh, and at the same time, they are this invisible infrastructure that uh, that all the different that impact all the different actors uh, differently and, and in the startup ecosystem different actors have different roles to play. So, how do we make this invisible common infrastructure um, in better? How do we actually develop the, the the infrastructure as a such? So. Policymakers look at this from improving the policy conditions, um, regulations, laws, but also um, uh, funding instruments and other public, public support instruments. While at the same time, of course, uh, uh, business owners and business builders are looking more how they, how they can navigate the ecosystem better, where they can find the information they need and how can they accelerate their development the fastest. But really the, the, the key concept to understand is that ecosystems are truly a common infrastructure. And similarly as you know, parks and roads, it doesn't happen by just pure bottom-up activity. We cannot in our cities, we can't start building our own roads or parks wherever we want to. Uh, there needs to be a bigger systemic uh, view to the matter. Uh, how do we architect our cities? How do we architect our infrastructure. So same applies to ecosystems that are invisible infrastructure. It really becomes not only of individual solutions, not one road here or not one bus line here, but how do these different uh, in, aspects of the inter infrastructure interconnect and, and uh, work together. So it becomes more about architecture and uh, orchestration than uh, anything else. 
So the startup ecosystems um, is this kind of combination of the ingredients from innovation ecosystem and uh, entrepreneurship ecosystem. So you need both the innovation side, the product side, the market side, as well as you need the people side. You need entrepreneurial people who actually will take action and make things happen. Uh, the innovation itself doesn't do anything. It doesn't happen by itself. So there's a need for entrepreneurial people. So startup ecosystem basically is the compose of both of these aspects. And within that startup ecosystems, uh, businesses are born and mature you know, like human are, there's first the nine months and they, until they come up to the world and then there's years of development from there forward. So similarly, the startups are incubated, they are, you know, maturing before they become, you know, officially out with their names and websites and ultimately registered companies and therefore, so the development phase is, is a key aspect of the framework that we use in everything. Uh, for, for understanding the different uh, life cycles in, in the ecosystem. So as a global picture, uh, there's also um, this aspect that these startup ecosystems uh, exist in different, um, different levels. So they exist at city, re city level, city region level, country level, but then there are also business verticals that cut across multiple ecosystems within the country and between countries globally. So this can be, uh, you know, finance, business vertical, travel, um, food, medical, and so forth. So there are different levels in the ecosystems uh, at, at kind of this vertical and uh, uh, geographical focus, but then there are also cross-cutting themes that go through uh, these the verticals across all the different levels at uh, geographical level, and then functions also. Funding is part of all of the ecosystems. Events are part of all of the ecosystems. Startups are part of, depending on their business vertical, uh, different ecosystems. So with all of that, like this is a, a, a we focus on the common problems and share problems. So everyone is struggling with this fragmented ecosystem information and connectivity problems. So fragmented in their own silos, trying to solve the same problems independently, reinventing the wheel, repeating the same you know, problem solutions and in worst scenarios, even in the same ecosystems when you know, government change or people change too much in the organizations, uh, you know, things are lost and many times the reinventing the wheel actually starts again by reinventing the wheel again by different people in the same ecosystem. So when we look at the ecosystem fragmentation at the systems level, basically this is what it looks like even in a big organization that is more traditional and not Amazon, Google or Facebook. Uh, is basically that information is passed through uh, human networks. So even between departments, uh, information is passed from, you know, one system, let's say an accountant look at the accounting system and then talks to a business person or a salesperson that looks at the, uh, you know, CRM system and then they pass information verbally. And oftentimes there's a broken phone uh, happening and when you put this at organ small organization level and then you scale it to big organization level and then you scale it to ecosystem level uh, basically the problem becomes that the, the core strength that is the human networks for innovation and creativity is not same for ecosystem efficiency and infrastructure and, and digital so there's a role to play to find the balance between where human connections and information sharing is good and that's creative. Maybe the creativity comes from misunderstanding what the other person said and they heard it differently than the other person meant and suddenly there's an idea for a new company. But uh, when it comes to managing accuracy or measuring the, the efficiency, it's, it's not the way to go. So when we look at what does this mean techn technology uh, among ecosystem organizations, it means 
question becomes how many tables, spreadsheets, databases are part of the, all of these interactions in, in your ecosystem. So think of it individual cars, you know, roads that don't connect with other roads. They just end where your focus uh, to manage that ends. Uh, think of it as a, as a part that doesn't have a design what the part actually withholds. No one is taking care of the grass or, or there is no playground for kids or nobody have, have checked that those actually are secure for the citizens. So it, it becomes a, a management problem when things are designed and managed in these silos. So then how places like Amazon work or Facebook work and, and these types of organizations, they basically have uh, everything in a, a system that is, you know, ones and zeros, it's logical by design. It is uh, managing that information and then different people have different windows to that same information. So different interfaces uh, from mobile, from voice, from a traditional web interface to, to um, whatever uh, different types of interfaces, but the information itself, the data is managed in a very controlled manner. And then interfaces are created as needed. So this is the high level concept of how to fix the, 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 the fragmentation, the silo problem. But of course, there's a lot of effort that goes into this and, and, and a lot of technologies needed to be looked at um, how is this actually possible? Amazon started this at 2002. So now we are talking about, um, you know, 18 years ago. So we can all see what uh, the outcome of this is in the global scale. Uh, of course, same applies to Google, applies to Facebook, applies to Alibaba and so forth. And in everywhere where this doesn't exist, there's a, there's a balance and a big transition in progress in accelerated progress that where this approach exists, this continues to eat all the industries and markets and economies where this doesn't exist. So it is as brutal as that, but yet the solution also becomes as clear as that. There is no going around this di uh, dynamic that is happening in the markets. So let's take a look to understand the digital economy uh, a bit more. What happens inside that cloud? What happens inside that system? <clears throat> so one of the things that uh, is a big distraction for those who don't work on the technology side, don't build the systems, don't architect softwares, don't model the data or don't code the software. Um, but even with those people, they merely see oftentimes their own perspective uh, from the technology aspect as well. But the main thing is that uh, for the most people, the software looks like the freedom much the same as it used to be, you know, decade ago uh, or even further ago. We use it as non-developers, non non-technical system architects. We look at it from the user interface and that's how we see things. That's how we pull information out. We print a report, we take out a, a PDF, we send that um, to another person who then, you know, visually reads it in the printed format, whichever that was, and can only have that view into that data, cannot use filters, cannot do other searches uh, and so forth. So what happens behind the scene is this is where the real digital economy is happening. And this is where, the, where those big boys play and where uh, also the modern startups play using the latest technologies of what is possible. So behind the scene, there are developer users, applications as users, so other applications to connecting to other applications. There's technical B2B users, um, let's say industry actors connecting their systems uh, in the value chain to communicate from manufacturing to, um, to, to uh, uh, factories and so forth. You can imagine how Tesla, for example, has built their car manufacturing 
uh, and basically the whole value chain, the whole logistics chain from all the parts of that goes into building those Teslas and ramping up the volumes, it cannot do that by not having direct digital infrastructures all the way through the uh, manufacturing lines. It could not work through people passing on PDFs with uh, purchase orders for components. Um, it simply cannot scale. So <clears throat> when we then look at what has happened in the software side of this, it's basically that uh, the softwares actually uh, are these monotonic boxes. This is how softwares have been uh, built for, for ages and ages. So uh, typically starting from MySQL database and then building software to connect the user interface to interact with data. But when you look at this application and you can take this as many portal applications even that you see there today in the ecosystems that the portals themselves are actually just silos regardless if we think that they are open to you know anyone to come and anyone to enter their information the reality is that people don't uh, and this type of portal approach closed boxes where people just come through the user interface to interact uh, with the information is just a bigger silo it's still a silo it's not connected to anything else its application is silo uh, of their own so this is an outdated architecture picture so the portal itself does nothing if the software of how that portal is built and what happens underneath is also looked carefully so basically what this means is that the software needs to be decoupled and and and, and opened up not only so that uh, it runs in one you know uh, uh, lamp stack silo in a virtual server somewhere in the cloud but it actually needs to have interfaces application interfaces so apis uh, to enable the data economy so that applications can connect with other applications and basically uh, the portal uh, or the solution also becomes open from the other side of the user interface so actually practically technically open for business so application interfaces apis to software and data uh, for technical b2b terms meaning that they are uh, one click terms to accept how data can be shared or how data can be added, how data can be used without needing to negotiate. Uh, how do we connect to your data or how do you connect to our data? Uh, these are technical interfaces or legal agreement interfaces that are just out there. Similarly, as you click those terms as a user, similarly, you should be able to click to use and in, uh, use or share data uh, through the application interface. So when we compare this to uh, the, the first starting point is that your application needs to be open and then that technically open. When it's technically open, then you can separately define how is it open for to whom and with what terms and so forth. But you cannot think of any of those. How is it open? Who can use what? if you don't have uh, the, the architecture uh, technically open for these types of users. So uh, developer users, other applications as users and technical B2B2 users in your ecosystem. And this applies not only to the portal, of course, it applies to your CRM soft system, it applies to your event system, it applies to your uh, ecosystem um, uh, information in all different levels. So the first step is to get out of this mindset uh, into this mindset. But of course, it doesn't stop there. So we need to move from this application centric thinking to architecture. So architecture thinking from to data and value exchange and connectivity centric mindset. <clears throat> so now 
when we are looking at uh, connecting these things, uh, we can see that uh, we can now, as these applications are open, we can start connecting them with one another using the application, uh, inter application programming interfaces. But this has then another problem built in. And basically, one of the, the, the things here is that you have to start thinking from basically thinking data as the last item when you look from the from the interface that if you look from the perspective of the users you start from the user interface and then you look at the, the software and then the data is somewhere there uh, deeper in the system one of the key things that you need to start thinking is put the data in the middle because the data is the key aspect of the value creation and it is the most uh, important element for the ecosystem applications and software are just means to get there uh, it's just means to manage that data it means to ma manipulate that data it means to analyze that data software itself is not the end goal uh, and it's not the thing that you need to focus on the data modeling the data data structures uh, common data models and managing that data through uh, catering that available through APIs is the focus area. So when you put the data in the middle and then basically put just APIs around that data, that is where you should focus as an ecosystem operator or ecosystem orchestrator so that you can have different interfaces uh, different windows to that data with APIs and then you can connect softwares as needed to connect to that data um, as, as needed. So now when you look at from this perspective that you focus on data and just have APIs around that, uh, you can actually build user interfaces by connecting to multiple different data sources and create a totally different type of user interface uh, or front-end application, if you will. And same, likewise, you can connect to different uh, back-end software, different features and functionalities that you would, you would need to, let's say, improve the data in your system. So this really becomes uh, to focusing on the most uh, sustainable part of the system and the most important part of the system and simply solving all the other problems by um, putting APIs out there and moving that uh, those other needs, user interface needs into to being decoupled and separate from data with much more flexibility as now with user interface, you don't need to think of any single data source, but you can think of uh, all the data that is available in the ecosystem. But when we move forward from that, then of course we get up to this problem that now we are building uh, a lot of different connections to different uh, uh, applications. So, this have a built-in problem with the scalability of connecting uh, more application uh, increases the number of the connections needed uh, to exist. And on one hand, this is a problem if the architecture is not designed properly, uh, because now this all of this would look like custom work. But when it's designed and architecture correctly, uh, mainly by focusing on uh, standardizing the data models and APIs, it actually becomes a problem that can scale. Uh, so the solution really is to focus on uh, the data model aspect and standardization of these connections, because then it becomes like electricity or outlets or any other things that are standardized that those who think that we want to connect to something else 
can build a connector using those standards that plugging these things together becomes very straightforward and easy. And it's not something that uh, requires custom development of how do I connect to that or how do you connect to the third party? Because the connectors themselves are standard as well as what data is shared between the applications. Another aspect uh, to look at is that the more the focus becomes about data, the more and more this type of uh, uh, <coughs> this type of operations can be uh, centralized to uh, be creating a, a distribution hub for sharing that data between different applications so that it becomes easier to connect only to one hub and through that hub to be able to connect to multiple uh, different uh, sources and, and interfaces. <clears throat> so I stop here uh, before we continue further, uh, just to check if there's um, any, any uh, couple of questions that we could answer and then we can, we can look at uh, answering more questions at the end as well. Thank you, Valto. So uh, we, we haven't uh, got any any specific question related to the content uh, that you have covered so far so we can continue if you like all right thanks so as a reminder please do use the opportunity to uh, use the q a or the, just the chat feature uh, to drop in any any questions that you may have uh, regards to the content so Continuing forward with um, how we look at this and how we are approaching, how we can best support the, the digital side of uh, development and uh, architecture uh, from our side. So one of the, the key things like uh, when, when you start to think about anything that is multi-stakeholder environment, you need to start looking at uh, common principles and common approaches. So we have listed here when it comes to the architecture, some of the core principles uh, so that uh, everything uh, needs to be focused on a shared open framework and terminology. Uh, the data uh, modeling needs to be collaborative and uh, made out as an open standard so that it can live um, openly like any open source software or creative commons assets online. And, and then we focus on uh, facilitating that uh, open standard development. The data itself uh, should always be um, uh, in the hands of the rightful owners. So if it's the individual uh, person, it should be their data and they decide where that data exists and how it exists and who can use it. And this is of course in Europe already uh, the principle with the GDPR uh, regulation, but the same should apply if it's a startup. So the startup company data about their activities in the ecosystem should uh, rightfully belong to them and they should be able to share that with the services that they use. And the same applies to support organizations, what information they have, regardless of where that data is, uh, it should be uh, managed through uh, by the rightful owners. So this is the, the one of the key principles that how the data circulates in the ecosystem or where is it physically stored should not be the defining factor of who has the ownership for that data. Um, from the technologies, one of the key uh, for the standardization of APIs is GraphQL. So everything that we are building is based on GraphQL uh, schemas and GraphQL API architecture. Uh, GraphQL is uh, originated from Facebook uh, where they developed it as internal uh, solution for their uh, challenges. And uh, then they later made it open source uh, project. And ultimately the, the, the GraphQL is currently uh, 
managed and the IP is owned by the Linux Foundation, which is the world's biggest uh, kind of caretaker of open assets online. Uh, if, if not the biggest, uh, at least one of the biggest. So, so it's a totally open source protocol uh, and, uh, and managed by Linux Foundation. We look at common assets development with reusability and sharing by design. So everything that can physically exist as shareable assets, we want to make shareable from our side, but also encourage everyone who develops the ecosystems and bits and pieces to also make those uh, as open source. Because it's not about uh, controlling those individual component components and pieces of software. It's how it's 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 how do you architect your solution and how do you operate your solution using those components. So trying to make those components bits and pieces as as commercial IP um, doesn't really help anyone. But the the what you need to focus on is getting the operations of how what type of system you built using those components and how do you actually make the user experience and customer experience including the software developers and other ecosystem actors and end users happy uh, using that service <clears throat> so this leads also to component driven development meaning that uh, it's not about uh, building individual monotonic big softwares, but actually decoupling that into smallest reusable pieces that are well documented on how you can use those pieces to build different types of user interfaces or different types of backend software uh, and so forth. Proactive data sharing, that means that uh, by default data should be considered open uh, and then separately from that position consider what data cannot be open because there is data that <clears throat> cannot be open but it should not be the, the way around that that uh, data is closed by design and then separately decided what can we open so it's a big principle and uh, in the open data market and open data field uh, this is a, a core, very strong core principle there and for example, places like City of Helsinki uh, have taken that into, uh, into use effectively, uh, as well as uh, UK government and uh, many other, other places. Uh, Domain-driven design, meaning that uh, we look from the common uh, terminology perspective and then documentation-driven development. So, the further and better we document the different assets we have in use, the more reusable they become, in addition to being, of course, uh, open source and, and te technically, op technically open to use, but only good documentation make them practically useful as reusable assets. And then interoperability by design as well, meaning that the connectivity aspect is not an afterthought of an application or solution, but it is the starting point that we want to create whenever creating new systems or updating existing systems, uh, the core principles should be interoperability, openness by design, and then uh, making that transition uh, from that way. And there's big, a bunch of different tools available of how to start that transition from existing applications for example, uh, opening up your databases, putting a GraphQL layer on top of that uh, to basically enable an API connection directly to your existing databases. Of course, with controls on top. So just making that technical ability to change. So as we have discussed uh, a lot of the uh, kind of technologies in context, I want to summarize a little bit of these terminologies. Uh, one additional component that we need to look at is this uh, data ownership perspective and we are uh, creating one solution into this mix to call circle pass that is an ecosystem level user account for individuals. 
it can be used to enable login to different uh, uh, windows the looking uh, login to different user interfaces uh, and applications uh, and then be able to share uh, users data between different applications with users permission where the data is owned and controlled by users so this is very much the data portability aspect that user can not only you know take their data from application A and make it available in the application B on their terms. Uh, but it's also that, in fact, they can make their own data where they have the master copy available to as many CRM, for example, uh, as they want to share that and in a dynamic form. So when the user information is updated, it's updated in the other systems as well. So this is a specifically solution to help uh, make data portable and shareable, uh, the user data portable and shareable between different applications. Uh, from data modeling, uh, the data modeling is designing uh, a data model for information system, uh, a model for what data and how uh, it is stored and used so data model normally consists of entity types, attributes, relationships, integrity rules, and the definitions of those objects. So you can think of data modeling in simplest terms. Um, it's like a you know, document, document template. So it's, it, it defines the structure of what information should go into that document without defining what the information it's, uh, itself actually is. So this is same at data system level and database level or data sharing level. It just defines the template format of how that data exists in the system without taking anything, uh, without looking what the underlying data exactly is or will be. And this is something that is the core piece of uh, building the the ecosystem level open standards for, for uh, connectivity. Uh, APIs are the application programming interfaces, uh, a computing interfaces between softwares. Developers use these connections to share uh, and use data um, or share also software features between applications. So for example, if you have photos, uh, photos in your data uh, pool, you could use external software con uh, computing to, for example, change the shape of those photos or identify objects in those photos uh, and then take back data. Now you have improved data about those photos uh, in your own system without needing to build a software that can do that. Similarly, you, uh, the most common things are, for example, payment gateways that uh, most of the applica modern applications that you use, use something like Stripe as a payment processor. So nobody would build their own credit card payment system in their more applications these days. So then this payment processing becomes a component in the, in the application world to build credit card handling wherever that is needed. But the APIs don't work without the data modeling. So data modeling and APIs are uh, go hand in hand. APIs themselves are just a technical interface to moving that data inside of the data system. But the data model defines in what format the data uh, is available and, or should be made available if writing data into a system. Data feeds are then uh, mechanisms to receive updated data from data sources. It, it is used to enable real-time applications in point-to-point -point settings. And the quality feeds have structured data that include different label fields like title or product. And the uh, front end usually refers to uh, front end development is the practice of converting information. So that data into application user interface. So mainly for the end users, 
So the typical interface is that how we normally interact with software. And the backend side is then any part of the website or software program that users do not see. In programming like terminal, let's say the backend is also the data access layer. So basically that takes us into uh, the, the ecosystem connectivity where we need to start looking the ecosystem from this aspect that we have the ecosystem data hub in the center and then we have the connectivity between different applications and user interfaces uh, with this data hub. So the end goal for the architecture is basically to connect with any number of other connected applications. And in the center of making those work is the application programming interfaces and the open standard data model, basically that in technical level lives as GraphQL schema and GraphQL APIs. And then we can look at separately what type of things we need to build data models for. We have people and entities, ecosystem support services, and so forth and so forth that then have their own uh, specific data models for different needs. And this is then what connects with uh, the domain driven design. And ultimately, when we scale up, we can look at that there are these different ecosystem hubs that should also communicate and uh, communicate with each other. For example, uh, local ecosystem hubs should connect with regional ecosystem hubs and business vertical ecosystem hubs should connect with local ecosystem hubs and so forth and so forth. So then there is a, a yet another level of connectivity between these different uh, levels and verticals of ecosystems. But to, to core thing to make this all work is not the work that needs to be done at individual software level or individual uh, connectivity level. The, 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 where to start solving this problem starts from the architecture level, data modeling level, and with the principles of making things open. So building an open data hub that can both take data in and can distribute data out in the standard format between different applications and, and between ecosystems will then make it possible so that anyone building any application doing any research can just start to rely on those um, connections to start existing and connect uh, when those become available. It is the only way that uh, this can be solved at the ecosystem level. So if we look at the conceptual data modeling a bit more, it is basically uh, this notion that we break the thing into uh, understandable pieces. So we have the bigger, the bigger thing that we then break down into individual things. So like uh, the people and startups or support functions or KPIs, and then we break them down within that domain to further pieces. So this type of common uh, data model has the following characteristics. It does not define the physical schema, nor does it define how the management system operates. So it doesn't define the technologies as such. It defines the resources and characteristics of management environment that the management system monitors and in, uh, analyzes. So what we have been discussing here so far. It is also in use when management applications exchange information about resource instances and their relationship with other resources. So connecting the applications, so it works for the APIs. It standardized the characteristics, the concepts, classes, attributes, and so forth. And it provides consistent definitions to items, terminology, and best practices for content. So basically the, what is uh, referred as um, an incubator, an accelerator, or startup, or um, funding, specific funding instrument, and so forth. <clears throat> and then from there forward, building a logical data structure, 
basically going into GraphQL. It helps common understanding of business data elements and requirements. Uh, it provides foundation for designing a, a database or data storage approach, facilitates avoidance of data redundancy and thus prevent data and business trends action inconsistency. Facilitates data reuse and sharing, decreases development and maintenance time and cost, and confirms a logical process model to help impact uh, analysis and uh, so forth. So when we look at then some of the key data modeling principles, we come to domain driven design, uh, which is a, a topic that, that helps us to kind of develop, all of us to develop and maintain uh, common terminology. So basically domain driven design is this uh, defining a ubiquitous language specifically in the data model itself that takes the jargon away from both sides, business jargon, technical jargon into something that is meant to be a common language uh, to discuss about the data. So it's an approach to software development for complex needs by connecting the implementation to uh, an evolving model. So it's, it's for, for the following goals to placing the project primary focus on the core domain and domain logic, basic complex design and model of the domain and interacting a creative collaboration between technical and domain experts. So there are a couple of books that I can, I can outline here for, for learning more about this topic. So I'm not gonna go any deeper for that. And then when we look at the technical data model, it really becomes about this open standard, open source GraphQL uh, model, where we can now build uh, with most practical format to maintain that data model and ubiquitous language for all of our master data models. It's, it's transferable, it's reusable, uh, it's free, it's open source. Uh, it's a tool to help build that uh, data model and open standard in a technically transferable format. Many tools available to, to, to work with that. So with Circle Pass, I also wanted to briefly look at the, that uh, how the data portability works in practice. So basically, when we look at uh, the uh, user data in the ecosystem uh, current, today, we can see that there's a service side of challenge. So basically, we have a CRM system where our customers cannot update their information. And we have to manually maintain that silo uh, of application. If we think simple solution, we would just open access for customers to update. But of course, we already know from our own behavior as consumers that we don't update applications uh, only at the time when we are interacting with the service and never after that. And oftentimes uh, we can maintain maybe two, maybe up to five different systems up to date that are mostly those big, you know, Google, Facebooks and so forth, depending on what aspects of life is in question. So where's the user data in this? Uh, basically, the other way around, when we look at the individual's challenge, there's so many applications that ask them to update the information or use manually enter my data into these systems. So when we look at the circle pass uh, as an approach, now a user could have access to their own circle pass, but it doesn't work if there's not connectivity with the applications uh, with that. So a simple solution from user's perspective would look like something like this. But there's a problem also with that picture. And that basically means that we need to build a connectivity between uh, different applications in this way, but then it also becomes a problem again with this multi-connection uh, approach. So again, the, the solution is that there needs to, the data hub is also needed to connect, simplify the connectivity between these uh, 
solutions and that's how it connects uh, with the ecosystem OS uh, architecture approach. So inside the data hub, these connections are managed from one connecting application to multiple actors in both ways. And as such, uh, it can be made uh, work for individual level and individual support service level in a scalable manner. So it can also then, of course, the whole point of ecosystem uh, OS uh, architecture data hub is to make it available also between service side applications. So each of these, uh, each of these uh, individuals have a dynamic data profile with the standard data model that can then interact and share data between these uh, systems. So for example, uh, just simple things like name, email, uh, contact details, uh, for example, is already a big, uh, big, small, but a big solution for, for scalability problems. And the same way this data can be shared, uh, the support site data can be shared and distributed through a data hub. So to move forward, um, basically to, to get something practical going, the, the tar starting point really is to just think of single data domain. And we have basically recommended oftentimes to start with events data and just think of it, how events data, uh, it's already public by nature. It's all, already, everyone wants to promote it. Though, so there's no, you know, license liability ownership issues. It's something that is uh, people want to distribute widely and, and be used widely. So it's a good starting point. It's really to take something as simple as that to starting point and then starting to add more data domains one by one. So not to start thinking of how we take the whole ecosystem and start to work on that, but starting simple. So design on one data feeds to be tested, create needed mockups for user uh, interfaces or use case uh, or use existing uh, user interfaces, depending on what the feeds are. Prepare prototype for user testing and then expand from there. So basically breaking that further down to standardize and interpret documentation along the way, repeat with more end to end prototypes, compare finding between research outcomes and so forth. So how to start as an ecosystem builder, operator or development financiers, uh, make sure that those principles are embedded into any application, request for proposal for new things when they are going to be built and so forth. As an ecosystem builder, I need to properly evaluate candidates. So supplier evaluation and project delivery advisory. So we can help in any of these aspects of how to include these principles and this, um, these mindsets into the request for proposals or when evaluating new system providers, when you are looking to build a new software or a uh, new solution for ecosystem that is validated to, to basically um, be based on the, the, the technologies that are actually commercially out there to be used, but there's still a lot of those who are not using them. When designing new applications, so feature designs, UX design, uh, because those applications should not be considered as something in the silo, but really as something that um, are just windows to that data in the ecosystem. So databases to, to data hubs and windows on top of that. Open standard data model considerations, application connectivity, and then how the user's data portability is taken care of. 
So getting towards the end uh, from the big picture perspective, um, as a long-term vision, it looks complex and it is a big undertaking, but that's what it, what it is in reality as well. The key thing is to understand that these systems have been built many times, that all the technologies exist. It's more about taking them into use and knowing how to break the thing down into smaller pieces. So the starting point is really, really just to focus on something simple while having that big picture in mind, not letting that big picture to stress and uh, become the blocking factor of why this isn't started, why this isn't being built. Because every action uh, the, the, that is taken for the future should be based on that big picture and the big target. Um, the main problem that exists is that the big picture is not in place. Uh, or it's not even known what that big picture should look like. And therefore, every single action taken today with existing resources uh, are just repeating the problem instead of gradually building the solution uh, for what it needs to be. So one of the things that we, we are doing is, a, is creating a pilot project around one of those data feeds. Uh, it's not the only thing that can be done. We are happy to help in, um, in those who are building uh, focus uh, or technology solutions for other feeds. But this is one thing that we are building a multi-stakeholder collaborating project uh, to be done together with more, more ecosystems instead of doing one ecosystem support at a time. So, the one of the key aspects in the ecosystem is, of course, service mapping, what support services are available and getting that into organized um, information. So we are, we are creating a prototype project and through a, this collaborative project, we are looking to uh, mature that into a commercial uh, level uh, solution. Um, with uh, software focused on the mapping. So basically standardized data model for capturing the, the, the uh, support service information. And these have already, these uh, canvases have already existed in our uh, shared access pool for, for several years. We're just putting them in a digital format now. Adding service details for, for uh, based on that data model and building more of uh, template services to make to accelerate that mapping process based on the commonly available uh, support functions out there that then can be just uh, refined for content uh, with details of the local information. When the ecosystems are mapped, we now have the data available in digital format through APIs to be distributed to any system, whether that's an event system, whether that's a CRM system, whether that's e-learning platform or so forth that other users are interacting where they can come across what are related support services for the e-learning content that I'm consuming now and so forth. The key is to capture that information first and make that information uh, distributable in, in legal sense, in technical sense in standard sense. So we already had a, a deadline around this uh, for applications, but we are extending that uh, further because we, we had this uh, webinar also um, added uh, recently. So we, we felt it's, it's uh, suited here. So uh, if you are interested, please uh, reach out to us to learn more. There's a separate webinar recording of that uh, project available for full details about that. So if, if interested, then this is one way to go. And then uh, finally, one more uh, point that I, I wanted to add that, uh, that as part of um, Startup Commons, uh, further focus on doing all the similar things that we have done in the non-digital world for supporting and building open source developments and so forth. Uh, we have also transitioned um, uh, the Startup Commons as part of DigiOLA, 
for for uh, a new company that can uh, acquire further resources and also can further develop uh, the focus uh, and solutions also for business vertical size mainly to start interacting uh, in more practical level with uh, the bigger companies that we have got a lot of requests to work as well uh, instead of uh, those locally focused ecosystems that are typically driven by the public sector side so we are um, in the in the, in this year and the next year also uh, designing more of the solutions because we see that um, the the business vertical side is suffering equally as bad there's huge number of uh, vertical ecosystem challenges that then interconnect with uh, the the local ecosystem challenges and, and and we want to make this more clear on the branding level that uh, that there are basically these two sides to business vertical private company ecosystems uh, development support and then uh, to continue to support on the public sector side where both equally uh, benefit from uh, the developments of uh, both sides so with that i want to thank you for for taking part we went a bit over time from uh, from my side but um, if you didn't have that in calendar the good thing is we have the recording made available and uh, and we will uh, be happy to get back to any questions that you may have after after this session so i'll i'll stop here and also in case there are any questions um, that have emerged along the way i'm happy to also cover those here for those who still want to hang out hang out with us in this webinar thank you Walter. Uh, i think that we got a couple of, of questions at least so far so right. the first one comes from uh, daniel he's asking how is the ecosystem always relevant in terms of API sharing in product development? Like for example, e-commerce product development. So, so basically while the, the, the ecosystem always is, is more of a technology stack and uh, we'll be doing more like detailed uh, um, webinars also going forward and of course publishing more and more of this information online. Uh, we're only getting started with uh, with putting all of our uh, uh, research and uh, past developments openly there as uh, open kind of open source assets. But basically the key thing with that is that we have the, the technology stack approach. So whatever the, the data is, whether it's KPIs, for whatever purpose that is, it's more about looking at the, the, the tech stack and architecture to how to solve that problem. So uh, with KPIs, the key aspect is, is of course, uh, is, are those only internal KPIs or is it uh, KPIs for uh, cross the board for benchmarking, for example, for other similar, um, similar things? So, so um, then it comes about standardizing those KPIs uh, from kind of terminology perspective, and then also standardizing them from the, uh, the data structure perspective, because the, the KPIs are only as good as how, how they are designed and how well they are sustained. Uh, the worst type of KPIs is what we see that every project gets new KPIs uh, or different actors doing the similar function are using different KPIs, and then there is no comparability. You can't compare with the previous year or previous project, or you can't compare and benchmark yourself with similar act actors in the same activity. So therefore, the KPI in silo means that uh, you, regardless of the numbers, what it shows, you don't know whether those numbers are good or bad because only the benchmarking and comparability to something that you can understand is, that is measured with the same KPIs 
gives you the answer of um, how good or not so good you are performing. All right. We, we got another question from uh, Greg. He is asking if, uh, would we have anything for a technology transfer office trying to link uh, the various connections in this ecosystem? Uh, yes, we actually have a full concept around that, which is called uh, op op uh, Open IPR. So we have a concept designed already um, a while back, but we, at the time, we didn't have the right technologies available in the markets uh, in the mature level, which they now exist. So building this uh, Open IP IPR solution uh, into something for a technology transfer office is something that can be done very cost effectively and would be a great uh, a great data feed exercise of how to put uh, the, the transferable technologies available in, in techni technically open sense and, and then looking at from the agreements perspective who can access that data, how it can be used for at what level, for example, just top level information can be public and then more further details of that technology IP can be uh, accessed per request and, and, and so forth, but making that available at ecosystem level instead of software level uh, is the key consideration. And of course, when doing it at ecosystem level, then it should start to include uh, technology transfer from other actors in the ecosystem. So let's say a startup exit, a big company R&D, uh, findings that they are not commercializing themselves and so forth. So the key would be to build uh, a broader pool of technologies available in the ecosystem. And then of course, helping to stand, uh, connect that with other similar functions in other ecosystems uh, and, and really thinking that as a digital ecosystem solution instead of application solution. Thank you, Valto. Greg, Greg, Greg still uh, continue asking about how would they locate that info? Uh, open IPR. Uh, yes. We can send that. I think we have a link in our website, but uh, we can follow up directly with that. Uh, so just feel free to send us a, a message or contact details. So we'll, we'll get you a full uh, concept presentation of that with uh, with a proposal if you want. All right, so we also have uh, another another question from uh, Nekmi. Uh, it's more like a thought or something like that. So he says, or she says that it seems like uh, the digital economy is adding a new aspect to the globalization. And I wonder how much individuals are benefiting from the digital economy or the high-end companies of the global economy are dominant and they are programming a future uh, they, where they want us to experience by using the data they get from us. So in short, how democratic is the digital economy? It's only as democratic as the people making decisions are aware of the capabilities and make decisions towards democracy versus the other way around. So the main problem, of course, uh, is that uh, that any any doing anything practical, doing anything concrete, doing anything scalable in the digital landscape require people who make decisions that understand that and have the democratic values uh, that they want to promote when they build those solutions. So if it's only driven by, uh, let's say, uh, purely capitalistic uh, model, uh, stock market investors. It's basically driven by finance uh, KPIs and whatever improves those finance KPIs is of course what happens if uh, the whole decision-making structure is based on driving financial outcomes uh, until uh, of course the regulators start to step in which we have seen the great uh, developments in the regulatory field um, uh, by most notably the GDPR regulation in Europe that is also uh, expanding in other countries, in Brazil, in Canada, in Japan. 
And uh, uh, one of the topics, if you want to learn more about this development, you should look to mydata.org my uh, as, a, as a resource that specifically looks at the individuals, uh, how to structure architectures <clears throat> that take that aspect into account. And we, of course, in, in, in startup commerce and, and digital side, uh, have designed the whole circle pass product with those concepts in mind, but uh, they only work if there's you know places to connect and, and 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 so forth. So the key aspect is really that those who make decisions should be aware of what those decisions lead to, and understand that from the technology perspective. <clears throat> All right, Valto. So I think that we don't have more questions so far. All right. I think I think that we can we can conclude here, and uh, I'm I'm uh, happy that we had such a wide uh, group taking part. And uh, as as mentioned, we are making this available as as a, a recording afterwards, and also making the materials available. And we'll continue to uh, build on these topics with uh, further details, also based on uh, the questions that we get here and also uh, afterwards, so that we can also bring more uh, specific case examples ar around. And those who are considering, you know, starting their own first uh, pipeline data feeds, uh, we are more than happy to look into starting with uh, with some simple solutions and help set up, uh, for example, on your side, the first data hub as a, as a prototype, looking from whichever um, topic you have that you want to follow up and uh, make a pilot that with you for that. And at the, at the context of that to really introduce the practical solutions that are are available there <clears throat> and um, yeah all right so uh i think that we can conclude here thank you everyone for for attending it was great to to have you all here in this uh webinar that we have organized today and see you soon bye thanks everyone bye bye